Chris Courtney here, New Pragmatic. Now that CouchBot has done its thing, we can get our weekly workshop underway. Thank you, CouchBot. You are you're quite helpful. Um, if you're following along in the Discord channel, I do see a few of you over there milling about. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Tonight we get to play with one of my favorite toys. It's Figma, and um, obviously there's a lot of different directions we could go with Figma, but tonight I wanted to specifically focus on ways that we can really utilize Figma for typography. And when I was doing a little bit of research, kind of uh, gathering my thoughts for this session, I stumbled across a few things that I was previously unaware of. Um, one of the things that um, that I've discovered over the years, uh, and it's been literally years now that I've been using, using Figma, is that um, there is a distinct difference in how typography works between the desktop version and the web version. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift my screen over. Um, so let's shift that over. And there, if you've ever worked with, with Figma, and we will go, we will actually use Figma here. If you've ever worked with Figma, what you'll what you'll know right away is that anytime you select this type tool, a world of opportunity opens up for you. And it may seem just magical how many how many typefaces that you have available to you just out of the box. Anybody anybody who ever grew up in the and some of these, some of these are not quite even showing up. But anybody who grew up with uh, Adobe Tools will know, you know, it was a constant, it was a constant, um, a constant act of seeking out new typography, and, and, and that's simply not the case anymore. Um, Figma, Figma, anything that's available in Google Fonts is available in Figma. The two are just coupled together automatically. That means that. Anything that I might discover over in Google Fonts, which we will do right now. Let's come over here to Google Fonts. And we'll go to Google Fonts. And go ahead and plug that in. Here we are. So anything that we find. We could find the a, a, a really random font. For instance, I will look for... Slabo, okay? Let's look for Slabo. Slabo, I've never heard of it before. Let's just see if it's available. And what we should find is if I type in Slab, oh, I've never installed Slabo, but lo and behold, let's go ahead and blow up old Slabo. That is Slabo. If I wanted to confirm that that is Slabo, I could sit here and let's go ahead and, and open that specimen up. And this is Slabo. Let's just look at the let's look at the S here on Slabo. And if we look at that S, that S is indeed Slabo. Um, I think it's really interesting that without much effort at all, and there appear to be two different weights here of Slabo, but without much effort at all something that, that I just randomly picked out of a hat on Google Fonts was already available inside of Figma. Um, this can lead to a lot of really terrible typography, to be completely honest with you. If I, um, if I go back over here to Google Fonts, and let's, let's purposely find a terrible font. Um, and fonts aren't terrible just because of the way they're created. Fonts typically are used in, it's about usage. So I apologize if I'm about to pick on your favorite font, but I'm gonna come through and I'm gonna go ahead and look at categories. And I'm going to say that I'm looking for a, you know what, let's go for a display font. And we will go with, um, what is something that I know that I have not installed? You know what, vibes. I am pretty certain that I have not installed Vibes. So let's come back over, and I'm gonna type in Vibes. And Vibes did not show up. Okay, that's interesting. And look at that, Vibes is not there. 
interesting. Interesting because it's clearly available right here on ye old Figma. So I'm gonna select this font. I'm just going to dig into this for just a second because it was my understanding that if it was available inside of Google Fonts that it was available inside of. So local font files will affect the way websites are displayed on your machine. So let's go ahead and use Sky Fonts. Um, Sky Fonts for anybody who is familiar with utilizing uh, Google Fonts will know that you can install Sky Fonts. I already have it installed. It's actually right here. Um, but I'm going to say browse Google Fonts. And now I'm going to go for Vibes. And if I spell it correctly. All right, so there is Vibes. I'm going to say Sky Fonts, add the entire family. I'm going to add it. So now Sky Fonts is added. It's on my computer. I can utilize it. So I'm going to say OK and I'm done. And now I will go back to yeah my fonts. I've got Vibes in here. I'll come back over here and I will look for Vibes one more time. It did not take. And I, I suspect what I will need to do here is I will need to restart. So I'm going to go ahead and quit Figma because we're doing hey, it's a live workshop. We're workshopping this. We're going to restart Figma. And now I'm just going to check OBS. Yes, we are sharing our screen. Now that we've got this open, you can see I got a lot of student work here. Um, I'm going to go back into this untitled untitled uh, document and um, let's see what vibes has to offer for us sorry about the noise in the background it's taking just taking figma just a half second longer than I would like to load this evening and come on figma you can do it this is what happens when I have just too many files open. It takes a, takes a second. All right, so now we've got Figma reloaded. Let's go ahead and highlight this. Let's look for vi Vibes. And there is our quirky Vibes. That, that, is the, that is the terrible power of being able to call in typography at a snap. Um, but what is interesting about that it was it was my understanding that everything that was in Google was available just automatically. That's not the case. But as we just saw, if we go over to Sky Fonts and install it right there, Vibes was. Let's do that one more time. I just want to. I want to try to locate one more font that isn't already available in, inside of Figma. So, and this can be. Uh, this could be. You know, there's 2,800 fonts in Google. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. So Google, give me um, give me press start. Press start is clearly a throwback to gaming culture. So I'm gonna go look for press start over here in Figma. Oh my God, press start is already. Wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? The the one time I'm I, the one clearly bad like that's not a great font. But there it is. Um, let's go ahead and find another one. Black Ops One. That looks pretty heinous. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get ourselves into Black Ops One. So let's look for Black Ops. And wouldn't you know it, Black Ops One is also available. So a little hit and miss. But what that should show you is that a large number of the fonts that you can find in Google, even though I've, I've never installed Black Ops 1, it's automatically available. Most of the time I live my my life over here in the realm of like uh, Playfair, display, things like that. Um, you know, I love a good Playfair display uh, combination with maybe a, a little Montserrat 
Yeah, we'll kick this in here and we'll say Montserrat. And let's go ahead and put that in regular, maybe um, 24. And you know, what, when you're when you're in here and you're working with typography and you're trying to get it to pair up, it's always good good to have like some content to work with. This is where a plugin like uh, Lorem Ipsum could come in. I'm gonna just uh, gonna generate. And there you go. So we've got a nice little combination here. Our, our purpose this evening isn't, isn't uh, necessarily to, to identify a good pairing. We're actually gonna spend most of our time looking at just the, the functional aspects of, of Figma. And one of the things that I wanna point out right away is that there are fonts that are available on my local machine that are not available in your local machine. One of those fonts that if you were to open up Figma on your machine, one of those fonts that you wouldn't see, it's called Circular. There's Circular. Circular, um, for those of you, and I would not I would never really pair it with Montserrat, so I'm just gonna change this to Circular as well, um, although I'll leave it as book. Um, circular is, better known by a lot of people as the Airbnb font. So if you've ever ever seen the Airbnb um, design system or the website, um, Circular is, um, is a paid paid uh, font um, that you would have to you'd have to buy a copy of it and download it to your local machine. You wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have it available um, through a through a service um, like Google Fonts, for instance. So when when I go to share this my a, a Figma file, not necessarily this one because I haven't really saved this, um, but if I were to go share this file with you, if you're watching this, what you would notice is that Playfair Display and Montserrat would show up just fine for you, but it wouldn't show. But Circular, while you would be able to see it, you would not be able to edit it. You would not be able to do anything with it. And it's because you wouldn't have a copy of that typography. Um, so, so because you lack a copy of the, of the typeface, this would cause an issue. And this, I, I mentioned this because it's, it's an important break point that you need to be aware of when you're sharing files with other people. Um, you might be in the program here at New Pragmatic. Uh, you might be working with a client if you're sharing something that has a font that has to be downloaded and installed on your local machine, it's not something that exists online, you have to include it and send it along with them uh, so that they can have a copy of that font as well. And um, there are all sorts of rules and regulations around who can have that font installed on what machines. So it, it, it's a lot deeper than just give them a copy of the font, but understand that if you're working with fonts that are on your local machine, it's going to potentially cause an issue. That is not me making a stance on you should always use Google Fonts. I think there is a lot of great typography out there that is um, protected by licensing agreements that um, you are, you're really required to buy. Um, there's a lot of great typography that should be purchased. Um, but understand that if you're working in Figma and you're sharing files, if it's on your local machine and not available online or not available in a common repository, then you could have you could have display issues. Um, also, if you're in the Discord channel and I saw many of you uh, poking around just a, just a moment ago, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I'm happy to have you uh, riding along with me. The other thing I wanted to point out is we had this discussion about local and and um, and web web fonts. Figma has a unique break that is uncommon amongst most graphical design programs in that Sketch you have to download download the application to your to your uh, device to your uh, laptop and you can use your local fonts. Um, Adobe products you download and you, you install them and you use your local fonts. Figma 
works the same way. You can download the desktop app and use the local fonts. But I wanted to take a second to, uh, to get back to this. And it is that if I go to Figma, uh, let's just go to figma.com. It's gonna open up one of my files probably because I've, I've got a, a string here that's already in the URL. Um, if you go into Figma in the browser, you have to ask yourself how, you know, I'm, this is an example page that I was working on for another, another project, but how would I get access to Circular? So there's Circular. Circular is not a web font. Circular is available on my local machine. But I'm online. I'm on the web right now. I, this is a this is a, a, a web browser. This is a Firefox. So if I'm in Firefox, but I'm using Circular on my local machine, how am I doing that? And the answer is easy. There is an install a local font helper, a Figma font helper, to, that allows you to utilize local fonts even when you're in the browser. Now, this is something that will trip you up if you're, if you're a user of the desktop app and suddenly you move and you use the browser. Um, I find myself opening up files, people will send links over, and they'll open in Firefox right away because my computer's just set up to automatically open links in Firefox. Uh, Firefox is a really great uh, browser. But in doing that, if I don't have this local font helper installed, this is gonna break because it, somebody could send me something with circular in it, or I could even send myself something, I could open up something I've created in the, the desktop app, and that, excuse me, in the browser version of Figma, and it would break if I did not have this Figma font helper installed. So that's, that's something I, I think is overlooked, and depending on how you come in, um, depending on how you come into um, using Figma, for, for me, there wasn't a desktop app available when Figma, when I started using Figma. Um, so I started using Figma just in the browser. So because of that, I naturally had to install the local font helper, uh, the Figma font helper, because I need to, I wanted to use my local fonts. I did not even realize that the desktop app wasn't utilizing that, that Figma font helper um, until, until much later. Much later, I, I, I discovered from talking with somebody else that this font helper is for the browser only but it's something that something to note particularly if you are not installing Figma on your local machine um, it is it is also important to note that Linux and Chrome OS or Chromebooks um, you can't use local fonts um, I'm not even really sure how you would host local fonts on a Chromebook I'm um, I'm not smart enough to use a Linux machine, so I will leave that to somebody else's pay grade. Probably Fonzo. Fonzo's probably watching, and Fonzo would probably know. So with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, and it is an important bit of housekeeping, um, we've discussed local fonts, web fonts, what, what you can find from Google, and how to get it from Google if it isn't already there. And that, again, is coming up here and utilizing Sky Fonts. Um, let's... Let's actually, yep, Fonzo. Hey, Fonzo, good to see you, man. And by the way, if you're if you're watching this later, every time we do these workshops, we're utilizing we're utilizing Discord for our, our communication. Uh, so if you have questions as we're going, feel free to bring them on in. Let's jump into Figma though, because I want to talk about the tooling of Figma, and look specifically at the different ways that you can bring typography in. So this, this type tool is pretty robust, even though it looks fairly plain, to be honest with you. If I click anywhere, it's going to pick up the last font that I had. Of course, the last font I had was, was circular, and it begins typing at 72, and I could type until I'm blue in the face, and it's just gonna go all the way across the screen. And that's because the bounding box is basically saying, hey, just go with whatever typography this is. 
So if I want it to, if I wanted a different experience, if I did not want this sort of long, and as you can see, I, I've typed for seemingly ever here. If I didn't want that experience, I could always come in, we'll zoom back in, I could always come in and click and drag. And by clicking and dragging instead of just the simple click, that sets the bounding box that's gonna naturally tell this typography to wrap. Now, as you can see, it broke there, um, and it's because it's it has a break in the, the gobbledygook that I have typed in. But you get an idea that the bounding box has some ability to, to control the typography. And that's a click and drag. That's how we've always done it. Um, one thing that I have not really spent a lot of time using, and it's only something I've recently discovered, is there's a lot of bounding box adjustments that can be made here. So in, in, in this particular version, I have a fixed size. And I've drug my, my text typography box to the point that the typography is now bleeding off and down below the box. I can change and resize that to grow vertically, and that changes the bounding box to, to encapsulate all the typography that I have. Now, a question you may have is what happens if you keep typing? Well, now the box grows with it. Equally, it shrinks with it if I have moved it. Now let's let's uh, change this and grow horizontally, and as you see, the same thing happens that happened before. If you're curious, and you may be, if you're like me, what's going to happen to this when we grow vertically? Well, nothing happens when we grow vertically because we never had a width to grow down, but we can change that. And as you can see now, it just naturally starts getting taller. So you can resize these bounding boxes. If at some point you've uh, you've clicked over here, you've said, hey, I've got this, and now I decided I don't want it to be um, just a horizontal box. I want it to, be, to grow vertically, or I want it to set in at a fixed size. You can, do, you can make that adjustment later, and it's really easy to do. So that is, um, that is just one little tip about, about the type tool and uh, the different, different ways that you can uh, begin using the typography tool. Um, one is a simple click, and when you do that, you get a horizontal box. The other is a click and drag, and when you do that, you get a bounding box, and that bounding box is going to be set to that specific size, but you can change that after the fact. So that's something uh, that's good to know. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had situations where I've had typography that's just over, uh, gone over, gone over, gone over, and nothing else adjusts. It's it's particularly important to to allow these elements to grow and shrink as needed because when you begin to create responsive components later, and we'll talk about that in a later workshop, the ability for this bounding box to grow as the content changes, changes the overall shape of the component that it's associated with. Um, Figma is just a lot smarter than, than your old uh, page makers or illustrators or InDesigns. So uh, understanding the basics of these typography tools is really, really helpful. Another thing that is, is helpful is the fact that while this is just a blank file, there's, there's nothing really going on here of note. Figma makes it really easy to start a new file and call typography styles into it. And to get this started, I'm gonna go ahead and create a frame. In this frame, I'm gonna make it a, a desktop frame. I'll go ahead and zoom in here. And I'm gonna to go to Assets. And inside of this Assets panel, you can, I, this is typically where you would see, this is typically where you would see components. So as we, were, as we create components, components do show up here. But there's also this library function. And the library function I find to be really interesting because it allows us to pull in styles that have been published from other sources. So if I click in here, I can see that my current file is called Entitle. I have no components or styles. But I have a case study wireframe, I have personal colors, 
I have um, Tudgel's uh, branding backup. I have all of these files available to me. Um, for this particular uh, um, version, I haven't actually published the changes that have been made to this video components file. And this video components file is pretty important to me because if you've watched any of the tutorials that I do, you will sometimes notice that I have overlays that happen in the background, or that I have um, I have previews that pop up on screen that preview on you. They're little thumbnails for YouTube, and I have styles that are created for that. Now, right as as of this moment, you probably noticed there is nothing for video components available here. There's no file here that says video components. I'm going to change that because we have styles that are created and I just I have decided that I want to be able to use those in this new file so I'm going to go go over here to assets I'm going to go to team library and I'm going to publish video components and it will say um, team library professional only sorry I want it to not publish components I want it to publish um, I, Components wasn't my goal there. My goal was, um, my goal was the styles, and I should be able to do my styles. Enable library for team members. I've published that. Let's go ahead and you know what? Let's go ahead and do case study wireframe while we're here. And what this has gotten us is it has unlocked um, it has unlocked a number of styles and colors that we previously did not have access to. So if I come down here now and I look over here at what well, seems like that should have just automatically updated for me. Let's go ahead and. Oh, it's because I'm not in layers. We'll come back over here to YouTube. Now, if I click down here, uh, let's go ahead and just make a new shape. Uh, so I'll, I'll make a new file here. I'll begin typing into it. Now, if I highlight and come back over here, you will see that I have all of these styles available for me. Yeah, Shane, all those styles, I have it right here available. And these probably look pretty familiar to you. So, so if you have created styles in one of your, in one of your pages, so here we are in libraries, this case study wireframe, that's yours. If we look over here, these are all, all of your, your, um, your files, your styles and your, and your color tiles. Those, those have been, um, those have been enabled for usage elsewhere. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see how that works, um, you, how, how you can draw other typographical styles into your work. Um, and then if we, if I decided to, okay, so that's a, that's one headline. I'm gonna enter some more text here and I will make this some sort of subhead. Um, let's make that regular, regular or small body text. All right, so this is how you can begin to basically have one file that has all of your styles in it and allow yourself to make changes and adjustments um, to other files through that one centralized file. Um, so that that's a way to call in styles really easily. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and publish this publicly. Um, actually, I don't wanna do that right this second. Uh, we will come back to this in just a moment. That's just changing it from grid to other. Um, that's components, assets, and updates. All right, so we're gonna zoom out of this for a second. One other, actually, while we're here, why don't we just stay here for a second? Uh, because there is something that something that I haven't touched on yet, but it's it's a big issue for most people when they're getting started. 
and it's this. I'm gonna go ahead and break this away from its style. I'm gonna break both of these away from it from the, their predetermined styles. Um, working with text as components. Yes, I sure can. Um, the first thing I was gonna do though is I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight I'm gonna highlight this this subhead here. It's Roboto, it's bold, it's 24, and that's great. But as if I wanted to, if I wasn't doing exploration here and I wanted to test out, let's test out this redacted. All right, redacted is a black line. Let's test out Rad Radley. Let's test out PT Sands. As you can as you can tell, this is getting old very fast. I can't tell what type are what this really looks like. I'm having to basically just guess and, and what that does is it pretty much guarantees that you're only going to use like three or four typefaces that you feel comfortable with. The solution here, if you're wanting to really explore really quick and you're not necessarily wanting to just constantly go to Google Fonts, there's something called Better Font Picker. And Better Font Picker, um, what I have found is that if you will give it a minute to load, it will it will provide you with accurate previews of everything that's in the file. So right now, like this doesn't look like it's changed at all, and in fact, it hasn't. But that's because it's still it, it's loading like hundreds of font. Yes, better font picker. Um, it's loading hundreds of fonts, and as you'll notice, like as you go down. Like you begin to see that there are changes that are coming in, like Athlea is here and, and Avenir. Avenir is a lovely, lovely typeface. Avenir, next condensed. These typefaces, if you will give them time to load, and as you can see, it's, it's struggling just a little bit. Better Font Picker is fantastic when given enough time to actually process the typography. And then you can see the difference between Georgia and Graduate without necessarily having to having to look at them and wait, you know, having to just individually select them. Like, you know, I don't want you to ever use Herculeum. Just like, don't do it. Um, but Hoffler text? Hell yeah, Hoffler text is one of my favorite all time serifs. So Better Font Picker gives you a really great way to, um, to sort through typography but if you just understand, if you have a lot of typography, it's going to take it a little while before you'll get the previews that actually mean something. Um, so just give it time to load. Don't don't give up on it just because it hasn't just automatically loaded everything. And if you do, you'll get the, you'll be able to see the difference between chalk duster and Comic Sans and circular without going through doing it the old manual way of up and down without a real preview. And I, I really wish that this is something that Figma would roll into into the product, um, but they just haven't. Um, I don't necessarily know if they will, but it's lovely to know that there is a, there is a um, something like Better Font Picker out there to work with. Now, um, Shane had a question related to, um, related to working with typography inside of components and I wanted to I wanted to touch on that for a second because I you know I think it's it's something that's really important to note um, as I typically go through and begin building components um, you if you if you've seen the YouTube channel you've seen these shapes before okay um, a lot of times I'm I create my first bits of typography, my first bits of typo typographic style inside of an existing component. What I don't do typically is I don't necessarily come over and, and you know, I'll say, I'll say uh, tutorial headline. Yes, thank you, better font picker. That's the one, that's the one. And again, Give it time to load. Um, my, I, I, I didn't think it really worked very well the first few times through, and then I, then I, you know, I gave it a moment, and it, 
it will load what you want to see. I'm going to go ahead and break this away from its initial, and I'm going to change this. Let's go with um, let's go with Avenir because we've been I've been fanboying on Avenir the last uh, little bit. So Avenir, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just do it in Roman. I'm going to say it's 48, and this actually, you know, let's make it black. Um, so this will also make it all caps and I'm gonna track it out a little bit as well and we will talk about these tools in just a moment but here I have here I have what is really by and large a label it's it's a it's a label of, that goes above uh, typography I'll change it to 24 so it's really a label um, what I typically won't do is I won't typically try to you know create a you know I won't typically try to make a component out of this. Um, I will I will come over and in my text styles, I will say um, section label. Okay, and now section label is available, and it happens to be um, this Avenir all caps uh, heavyweight uh, at 24, 24 pixels. But there's no need to come through and say okay and this oh, I'll put it over here for safekeeping this is a component of some sort because we don't we don't drag things over like that for for our typography that's not that's not how we typically do it well, if we're going to drag anything over as a component we drag over large units and these units are pre-built together so what I tend to do and I'm going to I'm going to break this instance. Uh, I don't want to swap the instance. I just want it to not be a component. Well, not so much. Um, detach instance. Oh, I can just delete it. I can delete it, and I don't need it because all I really have to do is. Anytime I bring in some typography, I can come down here and it's gonna say section label. But I can come in and I can I can pull in my styles. So for me, I I want I want styles that matter. You know, these text styles, that's what really matters to me. And then I will build shapes around them. So so let's just go ahead and build a build a style for a, a story promo. So there's my my label over overline. Uh, my next my next piece of the component is going to be this workshop headline, and you know I do think it's important. Like you can see, kind of how the bounding box isn't working there. I do think it's important to come through and adjust that bounding box to to you know work appropriately um, because these these shapes. If I if I came in here and made a component. I'd want this if somebody wrote two lines or whatever. I'd want this to expand with it. Um, this is this right now is just a one-line thing. I do think that that is way too tight for tr a true promo usage. Um, I'm not going to delete it away for right now, though. I'll just keep it in its normal usage. Um, this isn't really a component yet. What I what I need is I need a third piece of the puzzle. Um, I need some some text and uh, there's a couple of different ways that I could go about doing this um, let's let's do it piece by piece first and then we'll come back and look at it another way so I'm gonna break that I'm gonna go ahead and um, pull in this promo website I will use a plugin to throw some lorem ipsum in here And this is a pretty heinous uh, crime against humanity, if I'm being completely honest with myself. But I'm going to go ahead and save it anyway. Although I will, I will do myself the favor of breaking it and giving it at least a mortecum of self-respect. There we go. So a little bit, a little bit of spacing there. It, it works fine. I would group this together as a unit 
and then I would make a component out of that. So this is three different styles that are being used together that I, I could use as a component, but I would not come through and, and make individual components out of these styles. Styles are for styles. Utilize the styles together. Styles are really the truly atomic pieces of, of the design. You, you then group the atomic pieces together to create the component. The other thing that I would mention is there, if we have consistency between our components or be, between our styles, then it makes it really easy not to do this thing where we have three different shapes. And I've, I've talked with Shane about this before. I'm gonna detach this instance so I can kind of create what I wanna create here. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have this label. And I want this label, I want this whole process to live basically in the same box. All right, so now I'm gonna change this from section label to workshop promo. And you can see the difference between the two right away, like that this is really tight. Um, and then I'm gonna pull in Montserrat here and it's gonna get nuts because it's gonna all go to that giant headline text. So I gotta come back through here. I gotta de detach it from that and reapply it to this promo website thing. All right, this is pretty heinous. This is not great. Although, if I, if I just detach these styles away, the problem isn't the styles themselves, although this is not a great design. The problem is the fact that, the problem is the fact that is we don't have any sort of baseline grid set up here to govern these, these things. Um, if we went with a what, what they refer to as a four or eight pixel grid, everything would either line up on the fours or multiples of four or eight. Um, so if I had, let's say that this is 24, that, that natural, this naturally aligns with where I typically would like it to be. 100% of 24, um, in terms of line height, is setting itself up to be specific to Avenir. I want to look at this and I, I want to say, okay, what would a multiple of eight be on the line height? If I say 32, that pushes it down a bit. But then I can also add space between. And if I said eight, I'm starting to establish multiples of eight all the way down. Additionally, if I said instead of this headline being 100, uh, let's think about that. 100, 8 times 10 is 80. Um, 8 times 13 then would be 104. All right, so it's 104. And now I want to go look at what the multiples from 100, you know, what, what would that be? So I'm just going to say 104 pixels here because I do have it to be, it's rather tight. Um, here I basically want a negative measure. So I'm going to say 96. But I also want more space below. So instead of eight, I'll say 16. And you begin to see how this, how this can sp begin to space itself out. The, s the spacing is a little looser um, and that's okay. Let's look at down here at this, this next bit here with Montserrat. So Montserrat is at 20. What if we change that to 16 and instead of 16 on, and we said 16 on 24. And that didn't work at all because it's 24%. 24 pixels. And 16 on 24 works pretty well. Now, do you really need, need this headline to ever be 104? Probably not. Let's kick this down to 80. And then let's kick this down to 72 because we still want it to have that, that energy. All right. Now, everything here is setting up on an 8 pixel grid. Eight pi there's 8 pixels. Everything is divisible by eight. 72, uh, that's that eight, that's eight times nine. Um, this is 32, that's eight times four with 16 uh, between the paragraphs. Um, so basically that is saying um, that that's eight times two. 
Uh, we still got that same 16 below, so the spacing between these two and these two is actually even. And then we have um, we have you know uh, 24 as our line height here, and then we have 16 in between. So we we've, we've essentially taken the design that we had before, except we've made it to where everything can live inside of the same box. And this is going to work out great when it comes time for this content to be side by side with itself. I realize that's not really what we set out tonight to, to talk about baseline grid, but it does give us an opportunity to look at the other tools that are available to us in this text palette. Obviously, you can select your typography. You can select your weight. You can select your height. But this is the line height. This is the space. This is the space between these bits of typography. So if I highlight this and I say 32 taller, if I say 16, way too small. If I was going to multiples of four instead, I could say 20. And there you go. And that's fine. It's not bad. 24 is better. It just breathes more. Um, obviously, uh, if, if you haven't picked up, you know, we were, we were utilizing this ho horizontal spacing here. Um, I could say hundred pixels if I wanted to and get something really crazy. I could say 10 pixels. Um, I could also say one pixel or I could say a hundred percent and a hundred percent. It's uh, basically just the width of the character. I'm going to say 10 pixel and we're going to leave it at that. Oh, sorry. I should highlight the whole thing. 10 pixels. Um, additionally, this uh, line height is the space that is the space uh, is actually paragraph height. Uh, it's a space between the paragraphs. And then this is indention. So if I wanted to come and have an indention on one of these, I could. Now, because this is all one paragraph, that paragraph intention impacts everything. Um, but I think that that would change if we went through and created a specific style for this. Um, but that's something that we, we can look definitely look into. Also of note, um, it's not just about the, the things that you can do to the typography. It is about the things that you can do to the alignment. So you can center align, you can align right. Left align is standard. We can also center this in the center of the box. So you see that it's now got equal spacing to the top and bottom. You can also align it with the bottom. Very rarely will I do either of that. I, I do sometimes center align when I'm doing building buttons and things. Obviously, there was a number of tools available here as well. This is where we, we were getting our all caps. Um, we could get rid of that, that title case and make it lowercase if we wanted to. We can make it um, title case. This is uppercase. Um, you can also underline things here, strike through. You have alignment. We've already talked about resizing as well. You can uh, call on... Uh, for case sensitive forms and case sensitive forms is just relating to other other characters that are available in the alphabet that is provided. So while we've got our group here, Shane, uh, I see you typing. Feel free to feel free to ask any and all questions. Um, that's pretty much all I was going to walk through this evening. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm blocking a lot of fields. Oh man, that stinks. Well, let's uh let's fix that. Cuz I can Yeah, I totally totally see it now. Uh, my picture in picture was getting in the way. That stinks. Um let me let me go full screen with Figma. Hopefully that will help things. Also, if I um let's let's not do the stroke on that. If I open up stroke though and then hide it makes it just a little bit deeper. So now I've got the type up here. Um, what I was pointing out, uh, Shane, is that uh, we have the ability to for line height, letter spacing, 
paragraph spacing and paragraph indention um, here in this text field. Uh, you, you, we obviously know how to change fonts and change weight and t change uh, typographical size, but a lot of people are al always asking, you know, what are these controls for? Um, again, if I change the uh, width, here are the letter spacing, the horizontal spacing on the typography. You get something crazy like that. Very David Carson. Um, if I change the height, I'm changing the space here between the paragraph. So if I changed it to 32, you see that the whole paragraph changes though. And that's because these things are all, there's no, there's no specific styles that have been applied to these. These are all different, different uh, styles that are built in the same, um, built in the same shape. So uh, you would need to, you would need to create uh, text styles that were really altered for this dynamic. So if we said section label, there's section label, but section label is automatically taking on um, other di other dynamics. The same thing with um, if we said here with um, web promo headline, that's changing. And then if we brought in, I think this is website, promo website, obviously that, that pulls in that old style too. Um, I really think it's, it's much better it, it, it creates a much more unified feel. If we work in eights, um, eights is something that eights, tens, uh, fours, it, anything that has a consistency to it, I think you're gonna see a lot, a lot of benefit from doing it that way. So um, what you choose is up to you, but I would encourage you to find something to utilize and then build around that. All right. Um, any other questions before we before we wrap this thing up? I, I really my goal here tonight was to to get into some typographical uh, issues that tends to um, yeah OBS OBS let let you uh, hide that. Thanks, Fonzo. Um, I definitely I, I've had hotkey issues before. Um, for instance, I'm gonna. Shift six, and now I think my face should be showing up. Well, it wasn't, should be showing up full screen, and it's not. Let's see here. Yeah, so my hotkeys in OBS are um, hit and miss, to be honest with you, um, Fonzo. They, you know, this, uh, this shift six should be working right now and it is not. So that is unfortunate. Um, but other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, yeah, you can, so uh, Shane, Shane to that end, you can use pixel height in all of these. Um, that, that is something that, um, that is uh, super awesome. Uh, if you want it to come in and say, you know, this is 16, uh, but you could come in and say 24 pixels if you want it to, and there it is, 16. It won't take point. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd typed in pixel, but I typed in point just out of habit. Um, yeah, it'll take it'll take pixels all the way around. And letter spacing, if I said uh, 30 pixels, yeah, it does that. Um, now I no, I shouldn't have component size, but textiles, yeah, yeah. You know, Shane, it, it, we get into this realm of, we get into this realm of, I'm creating a design system and I need to have every, every particular thing that I'm doing needs to be a, needs to be a component. And that's really not the case. It needs, you, you basically need to have the ability to take a block of type like this and apply styles to it and then say, that's a component, all right? So, so that's why, you know, when I'm building over here, you know, let's just look in here for a second. If you come in here and, and look at my styles, I have this overlay headline and then I have this overlay subhead. Those are part of the those are a part of the video command overlay. So, you know, those are the things that pop in, but 
I use those styles inside of a component and then that component becomes, you know, that molecule, you know, if I'm, if I'm using the Brad Frost terms right. Um, I really see styles, styles are the, styles are really the atomic. Um, styles are the atomic and then when you use those styles together, they become the next, the next phase of that build cycle. Um, but, but I don't make, I, I personally don't make um, my styles into components because I just never, I never construct that way. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Courtney here, New Pragmatic. I hope this has been helpful. Um, the Figma workshops have been a lot of fun for me. Uh, I look forward to doing more of them, uh, but I believe we're gonna wait until after Thanksgiving to have another one. So uh, I hope to see all of you tomorrow at Feedback, uh, at <laughs> feedback Loop. Yes, actually it is for Feedback Loop. And until then, uh, have a great night. See ya.